With the coming of each new dawn, shadows of an ancient past echo across Australia, land of eternal mystery. Alien and remote for countless centuries, it remains today an almost mystical land, a land only recently disturbed by the arrival of man. Long before the time of man, there appeared here creatures among the most bizarre on earth. So unlike other animals are they, that many early European explorers could hardly believe they were real. Even today, three centuries later, Many of the questions the animals pose to science remain unanswered. Throughout Australia, investigators and scientists probe the secrets of this infinitely buried wildlife. Animals once dubbed living fossils have been properly identified and categorized, their evolutionary relationships better understood. Yet, inevitably, there remain more questions than answers. Haunting, age-old mysteries that beckon all who behold the spectacle of life unique to Australian shores. by the South Pacific on the east and the Indian Ocean on the west, Australia stretches for almost three million square miles. It is the world's smallest continent, the largest island, a self-contained biological laboratory unique in the world. Science has long been puzzled by how and why this island continent became home to what is probably the most distinctive assemblage of creatures found anywhere in the world. Part of the answer lies in Australia's remoteness, its geographic separation from the rest of the world. Cut off from the Earth's great land masses, Australia has evolved in sea-bound isolation for some 50 million years, its wildlife relatively undisturbed by influences from the outside. But the world as we know it today does not hold all the answers to Australia's past. We must look to a distant time in the Earth's geological history when the continents were joined. Scientists believe that somewhere in the continents we know today as the Americas, Antarctica, and Australia, the earliest marsupials evolved and fanned out. When the land mass split apart, the continents carried their life forms with them. However, in South America, Predators and competitors for food eventually wiped out a great number of marsupial species. In Antarctica, they became frozen out of existence. Only in Australia, safely cut off from competitors, could these unique creatures flourish. And until the relatively late arrival of man, they evolved, for the most part, undisturbed for millions of years. Even today, Australia's human population is only 14 and a half million. And because much of the interior is a harsh, arid land, the large cosmopolitan centers cluster on the coasts. A 
common myth about Down Under is that one can see kangaroos hopping down the streets of Sydney. Yet it is quite likely that many of these people have never even seen one, and perhaps never will outside a zoo. Zoos and sanctuaries are popular attractions throughout Australia. Here, tame animals provide the opportunity for an intimate look at some of the country's most treasured resources. Most of the kangaroos at this sanctuary have been raised here as orphans, their mothers the victims of automobiles or a hunter's gun. Under the watchful eye of a keeper, the joeys, as young kangaroos are called, can be cared for until old enough to be on their own in the park. A pillowcase is an ample substitute for the mother's pouch. It's a baby. It's queer on yeah, two hands, one on top of the other. Perhaps number one on any popularity poll is Australia's pride and joy, the cuddlesome koala. Chin up, straight over your shoulder towards the camera. Chin up at the camera. Okay, miss, just watching me, please. Hey, well, you've got a beautiful smile. Biffles and all. How about that, eh? Looking happy now, laughing? That's the idea. Look at me. <laughs> That's the boy. That's beautiful. Very good. Captured young, koalas come to accept humans. Even in the wild, they're basically unaggressive if undisturbed. Life for the wild koala revolves in and around forests of eucalyptus trees throughout eastern Australia. On the ground, just to move from tree to tree, the koala spends almost all its time high in the branches. It has developed highly specialized adaptations for its arboreal life. Long arms, well-padded paws, and opposable thumbs with a vice-like grip. Not only home and shelter, eucalyptus trees provide the koala with its primary food. It eats about two pounds of leaves a day. Despite superficial resemblance, the so-called koala bear is not a bear at all, but a true marsupial, a pouched animal, like the kangaroo. After birth, the young will stay in the mother's pouch for about six months. When strong enough to leave the pouch, it will do so only intermittently, and for the next few months will travel everywhere with its mother, clinging either to her back or chest. has inspired myriad reactions from observers over the centuries. One author has written, the koala's expression always reminds me of a Byzantine Madonna or some dowager duchess, rather bored, well-fed, and well-bred. But many Aborigines saw something quite different. To them, the koala represented the reincarnation of the spirits of lost children. A research team from Queensland's National Parks and Wildlife Service is studying the koala's ecology and reproduction in the wild. Their study area is roughly 600 acres, where 30 to 40 koalas normally live. He's going up higher than he was when we first saw him. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Led by Dr. Greg Gordon, the researchers have been capturing and tagging koalas since 1971. It is by no means a simple task. First, they must get them down. And as the wary animal climbs even higher, the pole must be extended to reach it. This is not going to be all that easy, Greg. This has got to 
going to drop just near the edge of the embankment, so... Yeah, that'll be rough, man. Experience has taught the scientists that the procedure is basically safe for the koala. Its sturdy build and thickly padded rump seem to protect it against the pull. That's it. You just below him now. Okay. You're right, Go on, drag him off. It doesn't hurt them at all, particularly when they come down on a branch like that. It's a rude awakening, wasn't it? Though easygoing by nature, a koala may become aggressive under stress. The bag is a precaution against his powerful claws and tenacious bite. Sought for its fur in the early decades of this century, the slow-moving koala was hunted to the very brink of extinction. Today, Thanks to government protection, koalas are once again secure. Recently, however, in this area of Queensland, there has been a puzzling decline in the birth rate. By tagging the animals and studying them over a period of years, the scientists hope to pinpoint the cause. In the meantime, thorough examinations expand their understanding of growth patterns and general states of health. Color-coded tags make the animal easily identifiable, even when high in the trees. This one was tagged originally when still in his mother's pouch, and much about him is already known. Tooth wear is about the most reliable indication of age. This male is roughly three years old. Yeah, we want to do his chest cleaned. On their chests, all male koalas have a scent gland which exudes a distinctive odor. By rubbing the gland on tree trunks and branches, they announce their presence to others in the area. Okay, okay we'll go, we'll go in the out of the sun. I think. That sounds like a good idea. Okay, fella. There we are, good as new. He's not going to go to that tree, going. He's gone. Momentarily disoriented after his release from the bag, the young koala seems unsure what to do next. There he goes. But within seconds, he heads back quickly to the same tree from which he'd been captured. Because mm, he proves me wrong. Okay. He took that rather well. Yeah. Sensing only that he is safely back where he wants to be, the koala cannot possibly realize how today's encounter with strangers may well help determine the future of his kind. Perhaps the very symbol of Australia, the kangaroo remains as fascinating today as when the first live specimen reached England in the 1700s. A handbill announcing the event proclaimed that to enumerate its extraordinary qualities would far exceed the common limits of a public notice. Now, almost two centuries later, a rare piece of film documents one of the kangaroo's most extraordinary qualities of all. After a gestation period of about a month, this red kangaroo prepares to give birth. Though scientists now understand the biology of marsupial birth, it is no less remarkable to behold. All marsupials are born in an undeveloped state, their growth to be completed inside the pouch. Defenseless and blind, the tiny newborn completely unaided by the mother, must navigate through her thick fur toward the pouch. If it loses its way, it will die.
Once inside the pouch, guided only by its sense of smell, the newborn finds one of the mother's nipples. Here it will remain attached, suckling for more than six months. Now the joey will be strong enough to leave the pouch intermittently. But even when it is old enough to graze, it will return to the pouch to nurse for several months more. Amazing in their adaptability, some kangaroos are as at home in the trees as others are bounding across rocky slopes. There are about 50 species of kangaroos in Australia, ranging from up to seven feet in height to the size of a common rat. But one trait they all share is that they hop. as 200 pounds, the kangaroo is a picture of grace when it takes to flight. It can reach speeds up to 40 miles an hour and cover as much as 25 feet in one leap. Recently, scientists were amazed to discover that at certain speeds, the kangaroo actually uses less oxygen the faster it goes. It was found that, like the spring in a pogo stick, the kangaroo's leg muscles and tendons store energy, which is then released without effort when the animal next pushes off. Though the kangaroo is no doubt the most famous marsupial, Australia boasts as many as 150 species of pouched animals. The ferocious looking Tasmanian devil is one of the few that eat meat exclusively. One can only imagine the astonishment of early explorers when they saw a pouched animal take to the air. These possums do not actually fly like birds, but their kite-like membrane enables them to glide for distances of 40 yards or more. Only in small patches of Western Australia will one find the numbat, a small, gentle marsupial now extinct in other parts of the country. With sharp claws, the numbat roots out termites, its primary food. Its long, sinuous, sticky tongue can capture thousands of the insects a day. With its distinctive bands of white and its bottle brush tail, the numbat is considered by many to be Australia's most beautifully marked marsupial. The majestic Blue Mountains lie 40 miles west of Sydney. Here, beneath the vivid blue haze which gave the mountains their name, areas of pristine wilderness abound. Nestled in the hills, an historic estate called Yengo spreads across 25 acres. For the past 12 years, it has been a private reserve dedicated to breeding endangered animals. He's really heavy, I'll tell you that. The owner is businessman Peter Piggott. 
one of Australia's foremost conservationists. With his wife and son, he is transferring a wombat injured in a fight to a safer enclosure. Thank you. Come here. Come on. Nice leg to bite. Piggott's breeding success with wombats is considered phenomenal, better than any zoo, and is attributed to his concern for creating the most natural setting possible in a captive environment. Wildlife has, has always had a very special place in my life. But I always haven't been a conservator. When I was a, a quite a young child at the age of five, I lived in the country where my forefathers came from. And it was a normal, a normal thing for farmers to shoot kangaroos. And I remember at the age of seven and eight, going out and participating in kangaroo hunts where hundreds of kangaroos would be shot in one day. And uh, whilst I didn't wield a gun at the age of seven or eight, I did at the age of nine. And I remember shooting a kangaroo on a relative's property and I watched that animal die. And I asked myself the question, you know, why am I doing this? I think that that, on a very young mind, uh, had a lasting effect. I guess that my first opportunity at doing something very constructive in the field of conservation was the rediscovery of a wallaby that we thought was extinct. The Parma wallaby, a small kangaroo only about 14 inches tall, was abundant until early settlers destroyed its habitat and introduced new predators. Though thought to be extinct, a small colony was discovered in 1965. Starting with only 18 animals, Piggott has increased the population here to more than 200 in 10 years. A lot of people say to me, you know, why should we conserve wildlife? Why, why should we be really concerned? I mean, aren't people more important than wildlife? We are all part of the 600 million years of evolution. And I suppose that one of the great things that separates mankind from the animals is our sense and appreciation of the aesthetics, our love of literature, our love of art and poetry and of nature itself. And I often think that if we lose this, we disregard the world that's around us and the animals that are here. We might wake up one morning and find ourselves on the endangered list. The sky is ablaze with color. Australia has been called the foremost land of birds. More than 300 species are unique to her shores. One of Australia's most distinctive birds, the Mallee fowl, is a prodigious engineer. To incubate their eggs in a harsh environment that is generally dry and subject to sharp temperature changes, they build mounds up to 15 feet across and several feet high. Working together, male and female have laid down a bed of wet leaves and twigs. To seal in the moisture and heat of the fermenting compost, they cover the mound with sand. The egg chamber itself lies at the heart of the mound. Beginning in the spring and continuing for three to four months, the female will come about once a week to lay a single egg.
The Mali regions are marked by sharp temperature fluctuations between day and night and as the seasons change. But the egg chamber must be kept at an almost constant 92 degrees. Once the female has laid her egg, she will leave the tending of the mound to her mate. To determine the temperature, he probes the sand. With a sensitive spot, either in his bill or tongue, he gets a reading as accurate as any thermometer. Regulating the temperature by removing sand to release heat or adding sand to conserve it is an almost constant job for the bird, a consuming task to which he dedicates himself for up to nine months of the year. Roughly every two months, a chick will work its way up through the thick soil and wander off, never to see its parents again. From the depths of the forest echoes a haunting and memorable sound. The lyrebird, master of vocal mimicry. Seemingly endless in its variety, the lyrebird's repertoire includes other bird calls as well as man-made sounds. The mating ritual is highlighted by a shimmering display of the bird's immense fan-like tail. In central Australia, heavy rains have flooded the desert. But storms are few and short-lived in this harsh, arid country. As the clay pans begin to dry up, the water-holding frog demonstrates a remarkable adaptation. Increasing its body weight by as much as 50% with water absorbed through the skin, the frog burrows into the softened clay to a depth of more than three feet. Once underground, it will enter a sleep-like state, its active life essentially over until the desert once again sees rain. Encased in a cocoon-like bag of dead skin, the frog will remain in its chamber, sealed beneath the now dry and hardened earth. In times of drought, these amazing creatures have been known to stay buried for two years or more. Only when the rains finally come and the earth begins to soften can the frog begin to emerge. It must mate quickly so that its young will mature in time to soak up their own water supply and bury themselves until the next rains come. In the forests of southeastern Queensland, a major scientific discovery was made in 1972. Since that time, a bizarre animal, unique in the world, has been making history. The first noteworthy fact was that it existed at all. Australians had always believed that in their country there was no such thing as a frog that lived in water. Since the time of the original discovery, captured animals have been sent to the zoology department at the University of Adelaide for study by Michael Tyler one of the country's foremost experts on frogs. 